So with all of that said, I think there's not much else for me to do apart from just hand over power to Ari, who will give you an amazing talk into the work that she's been doing. And please do keep in mind how this is relating to your projects. Um, and Ari, would you like to take it away? Sure. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, excited to be here. This is such an interesting space, the University of the Underground. So um, I will be talking pretty quickly just because I always put too many slides in my presentation. So please excuse that, but I'm happy to I also want to leave time for conversation at the end. So um, radical imagination, I'll start mm -hmm. off with again, revisiting the um, who I am just to give some context as far as how I even entered this space and um, being as an artist all my life, that was the space that I was most familiar with. That's the first identity that I ever considered myself to have growing up. Um, and then finding design and creative technology to be really excellent tools and expanding the possibilities with art. So um, added those as you know, spaces that I would love to explore and, and eventually did. And then um, research of a lot of my work engages with research in ways that the work that I'm doing is tied somewhere into society. I'm an educator in a few different places and have loved just being in a classroom is one of my favorite places to be, especially in just being able to constantly be a student as an educator where the students that I teach, I'm learning so much from them all the time. So it's this constant cycle of learning. Um, so um, I'll be sharing a little bit of my electromedia practice and research and then how all of that has funneled into the pedagogy that I've developed and then how that has all inspired building Afrotectopia. And with my electromedia practice, um, a lot of it began with sound sculptures. A lot of my work, um, I was very interested in exploring and am still very interested in exploring the ways that sound can be reimagined as far as how it's composed, how it's experienced and how you just generally interact with sound. And so one area that I was drawn to a lot were developing these sort of what I call sound sculptures of being someone that has an art background, someone that loves architecture and how it creates these spaces for people to inhabit, but also a mental space, um, but you know, not having access to architecture on a full scale. So I feel like sculpture is a great kind of micro version of architecture in some ways. So infusing for me, I wanted to infuse technology into these sculptures, which generally would have been for aesthetic purposes of a lot of art, you can you, you create it with an aesthetic purpose in mind, but I wanted to make sure that anything that I was creating with an aesthetic purpose, it was completely tied to a utilitarian purpose of there's a function that allows people to engage with it. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of creative technology is that it that destroys that dichotomy between the artist and the viewer, so that the viewer can then become an artist as they engage with the work because it's interactive. And so I would build a variety of these these different sound sculptures where I'm infusing these different technologies, whether it's potentiometers or phototransistors and um, making it so that you're creating space, but you're also looking at something that's interacting. You're creating sound, but you're also looking at something that's interacting with the sound that you're developing and you're being, being very experimental. And so here's a picture of me um, engaging with this sound sculpture. Of, you see the variety of different sensors, like a circular ribbon potentiometer that I'm putting my finger on, or a phototransistor um, cell that I'm you know, moving my light towards and further away. As the light that's entering that cell is changing the amplitude or the frequency of the sound. So thinking of new ways to interact with sound has been something that I'm really um, interested in. And this was all in a time where I was in graduate school and in a course called New Interfaces for musical expression. And so we were tasked with simply creating an instrument of a different um, sort of a more experimental sort of user interface um, and perform with it live. And I was really excited about that because you know I'm tasked with performing with my own instrument, something I've created, but I also didn't wanna just tie only to the audio and hearing sense, but I wanted to create a multi-sensorial experience. So designing the video art behind me and the costume that I'm wearing and the lighting that's gonna be shown or you know projected onto me. I wanted to think about all of that and creating this really vibrant experience. And so it started by creating my instruments and I was watching um, the Jimi Hendrix movie at the time, which I thought cinematically it was so beautiful um, and just like the style of Jimi Hendrix um, of just like, you know, wearing a, a guitar. I think of rock stars, they have just such a cool aesthetic and appeal of holding the guitar. So I kind of wanted to imbue that within my own work. But a lot of my work also considers ways that I can use technology and its emerging possibilities on and, and impl implant that into analog technology. So a guitar is something I would definitely consider as an analog technology. And I wanted to explore how could I bring in these emerging technologies into this you know, traditional um, instrument and create a whole new sort of instrument. And so I, I did that by 
bringing in a few different sensors um, into this guitar, fabricating it, digitally fabricating it. So using like, like uh, a um, laser cutter and other machines to create the shape of it and design it all. And then as you touch the arcade buttons or the linear potentiometer, well, those sorts of things are all triggering different sounds. Another instrument that I created that wasn't anything new, it was just building it. Um, it, it's, it looks more like a, a drum machine but it has a few things that you wouldn't find in a drum machine, like a circular rhythm potentiometer. You know, you might find linear potentiometers, but you generally don't. Usually it's just a bunch of pads. So for one, thinking of, you know, the form and shape of it, of creating something that is aesthetically appealing, but again, even with the material, the iridescent acrylic, but again, it's utilitarian. You can use it to serve some sort of purpose, it's a tool. And so then it was a matter of performing with these. And at this time I was thinking of, um, you know, a, a lot of my work considers black culture very intensely because it's you know, just one of my passions and one of the main spaces that I love to explore. And in this instance, I was thinking about um, how often you know, it's hard to see black culture, black people um, in general in a, such a, a positive light because there's so many things that are being thrown at us or stereotypes or stigmas. And so I, I wanted to just take the, the moment and chance to create the scenario where um, this, what you're experiencing that's happening on stage is really just a mirror of the beauty of Black culture. So playing a variety, very experimentally, of sounds that are coming from, you know, different radio waves of Black culture. So just like putting a whole bunch of different sound that you would hear uh, in different songs. And then also creating video art behind me that's presented behind me. So you very vaguely see a bunch of TV screens. And in those TV screens, you see a bunch of clips of different um, music videos that I've grabbed and edited and, and put together. So it's just this hypersensorial collage and multi-sensorial experience of um, the beauty of Black culture. And I do this a lot. And the way that I've you know, found a, a place for it is in my love for pedagogy of how um, my love for a more experimental pedagogy of you, you don't even realize that you're learning or that there's some sort of paradigm shift that's occurring because you're in a space that's so stimulating. And so with these, with um, I've continued along this performance kind of work where I'm in the middle of environments and um, I would be using a variety of different machines and uh, you know, just creating sounds with them, live performance, but also bringing in a bunch of me media that's shown behind me. So you'll see a bunch of clips of right now, you see maybe a bunch of screenshots of a guy doing a tutorial on YouTube of how to put on a do-rag. And then you also see Janelle Monae, and then you see LeBron James and another clip from Kendrick Lamar's music video. And you just, you have a whole bunch of glimpses of all these different things that are going on in, in black life and black media and putting it together into one space. And, um, to show other, you know, photos of that same performance, but it's something I, I do in other spaces. Uh, there's also sound interactive um, code that I've designed and built on the left side. And then on in the right picture, you'll see these 3D animated characters that I've created. Um, and I specifically created these because I was also thinking about the construction of culture and the construction of an identity based on media. Media is, you know, pretty much the the entity that is creating our understandings of how people operate or what people are like, or if we should like them or not. And so thinking a lot about that, of how you know our, our mere identities are being constructed by media, but what if I took that power in my hands and I created this identity? I created, I literally created these characters and then put them into these spaces. And so that's what I would do. And I also have a, a fascination um, towards watches and watches that um, are translucent. So you can see all the gears that are going on inside. And I think there's something really um, exciting about being able to see something that's so technical and you know producing a lot and be able to see the inner workings of it. And so that's why I then place myself in the center of it with the, all of my machines being used. And people can see that I'm using all of my different machines and they see the whole setup, but they there's still this whole element um, of the way that I'm interacting with it and what it produces. And so continuing along these sound projects and thinking specifically of sculpture of, uh, or of culture too, um, this one is a series of sculptures that I more recently developed called Electro Negro Synesthesio, where I'm thinking about black culture artifacts. So generally when people are wearing, um, black people are wearing black culture artifacts, there's definitely a negative stigma towards them and stereotype towards them wearing it. You know, it's often associated with some sort of poverty, some sort of, you know, quote unquote, ghetto-ness or unprofessionalism. If you see a black woman wearing bamboo earrings, or if you see some, a black person wearing a do-rag, um, you know, they have these really heavy negative stigmas. But for me in growing up 
um, having grown up in predominantly black spaces, having seen these things around me all the time, bamboo earrings for some things that, you know, my friends in middle school were wearing every day. And I have such a, there's a strong sentimental value for me with these pieces. And I, I really see them as elements of beauty and um, to know that, you know, they're, they're seen in these other ways due to white gazes or media's constructions. I wanted to explore what if I recontextualize these, um, these, uh, artifacts and put them in an entirely new light, absent of association of, you know, where we are today, but kind of think of what is black culture of the future when it's absent of, you know, that social context, but it's creating an entirely new one. And that was the, the foundation of this project of creating a new context for these black culture artifacts through art and sculpture. And then I would also infuse technology into them to then create this other world experience of, um, you know, some sort of mystical element of the reason maybe that we are told that these are unprofessional items is because there's actually a whole other world behind them if you engage with them, kind of creating this sort, sort of narrative. Um, so as you touch the hair rollers, as you touch the bamboo earrings, as you touch the do-rag, you would then hear different sounds, all um, African drum pattern music that would play in response to you engaging with them. Another one was hair. So as you touch the hair, which is something that, you know, generally no one is supposed to ever touch a black woman's hair or a black person's hair because there's such a, there's such an intense relationship when people are doing that. Um, it can often feel like you're degrading them or treating them as if there's some sort of exotic animal. Um, and so wanting to create a situation where yes, also you cannot touch a black person's hair, but what if the reason why you weren't able to touch it is because, you know, magic would happen if you did. So again, creating this sort of narrative and what happens when you touch this hair and my sculpture is that music then plays and you can hear sound and with the afro pics um, sort of infusing this artificial digital kind of dna whereas you place the different art the afro pics on the bed that i've created you would then also see different projections of different media being shown on the wall so new ways that you know culture artifacts have the their own world um, another project that i developed while in undergrad while in graduate school was um and i'll go through this pretty quickly to get to the other stuff but racism is good, um, you know, I was creating these micro sentences where like this, racism is good, obviously a very controversial statement, um, depending on where you are. Some people would, you know, completely agree with that. Actually, I don't know who would completely agree with that, um, but the purpose of that was to create a triggering sort of um, micro statement. And then I was using um, a, a sort of color technology that I had explored and developed and put it onto different lenses. So I colored different lenses, different glasses, glasses, lenses. I had three different pairs and I made it so that in the way that I colored each lens of different hues and colors, they all held their own perspectives that they would allow you to experience as you wore those glasses. And so what would happen is you would see this visual that I've created and then you would wear one of the glasses and each of the glasses hold a different perspective. One would be a perspective of someone that's of an oppressing of an oppressor, someone that's generally an oppressor. Another one would be someone that is of an oppressed community. And another one would be someone that is against racism, though they don't un entirely understand how it operates and the nuances within it. And so this might be someone like a neoliberal, neoliberalist. And so um, when you wear the glasses of someone that's of an oppressor community, you would then see, um, you know, racism is good. And then what would be revealed when you put the glasses on are texts that only reveal itself based on the glasses that you're wearing due to you know, a manipulation of color theory. And so if you're of an oppressed community, you'll see racism is good for my oppression and that reveals itself, which you can sort of see in this picture. If you're wearing the glasses of someone that's of a you know, sort of neoliberal um, perspective, you might see, I don't think racism is good because you're still questioning, you're still trying to figure out what racism truly is, if you know, maybe you, you are. Uh, and so this was representative of how, particularly in the American society, but I'm sure everywhere you walk down the street and you see something happening in a public space and depending on your background, socioeconomic background, or, you know, political background or race or gender, you have an entirely different interpretation of what that is, an entirely different interpretation than someone that's standing right next to you. So this fragmentation of society is something that's being tied into. And the introduction into this exhibition was through a DJ's um, turntable. And as someone that DJs, I'm often thinking very critically about different Black cultural artifacts that have been commodified and hyper extrapolated, hyper, you know, produced and, you know, taken away from its social and general context and origins 
as you know, it becomes a, a feature of capitalism. And so what would happen, I was exploring a lot of what would happen if every time you engage with something that came from um, a black origin, you were required to understand um, a little bit more about the culture and the group of people that had developed it you know, black people or critical race theory. And so this was an example of that. If I wanted it so that anytime you engage with this DJ turntable, it wasn't just meant to be a tool for you to have fun with and eventually make money off of, but that as you were using this DJ turntable, you were then being immersed in into this exhibition where you were seeing posters like what I showed you in the last slide. And you were also seeing videos of people that were talking very um, effectively on critical race theory or, you know, seeing a video by Solange No saying, don't touch my hair or other things like that. And so this is a picture of people wearing the glasses. You know, you have one person that's wearing a perspective of someone, an entirely different group as the person that's sitting next to them. You see the different colors that are shown on the lenses. So they were seeing entirely different things um, based on the glasses that they were wearing. Um, and this is a more recent project, Metamorphosis, where um, I was thinking a lot about the protests that we had been dealing with in the states of um, the second uprising of Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, end of May, beginning of June, George Floyd being killed and this uprising, we were going through a lot with COVID and layoffs and all of these things. And so there was just like a, a culmination of a variety of different forms of frustrations that all volcanoed and erupted into um, a huge uprising that allowed for a lot of protesting to happen in the street. And while it being something that's very cathartic to chant in union with a, a large amount of people, things like no justice, no peace, or I can't breathe. I was also having conversations with people of other sort of mentalities that were saying, you know, these can be things that are affirmations. When we continue to say things like no justice, no peace, or I can't breathe, you, you end up manifesting these sort of things. And so how can we be careful with the things that we're saying and be mindful of, you know, the way that we're treating our experience in life. And so I was personally thinking a lot about the effects of turmoil and pain on the body. And this is something that is existing now as we, you know, we as black people navigate this world in a variety and navigating a variety of different oppressions. And so we have these turmoil and pain that are on our body from our current life, but also ancestrally, all the pain and turmoil that our ancestors dealt with and how those things continue within our own body through epigenetics of epigenetics being something that modifies your gene um, expression or genetic code due to the experiences that you're having. So even in, in, and they can be developed even in micro instances like participating in a, in a protest. So I wanted to create a space that was a positive reversal of negative epigenetics of how can I use sound and visuals as a sort of healing modality where people can enter and heal themselves through sound and thinking sound um, as far as frequency. So I was researching a lot of different ways that specific sounds and frequencies tie to different parts of your body, like, or just generally your different parts of your spirit. And if you're thinking of Eastern spirituality, there's these chakras. So there are different seven um, frequencies that tie directly to your different seven core energy centers. And then I was also, um, had known about African drum pattern music and African drum instrumentation, like talking drums or djembes, which have been used in a variety of historical pan-African revolutions, like the Haitian revolution. So I wanted to create an experience that was infusing um, all of these different sound techniques into an experience where people could um, heal themselves through sound and color. And so, as I mentioned, it engaged in a lot of research of understanding the ways that different um, frequencies of sound would, you know, what chakra they would tie to. Also the research in African drum pattern music and ways that they were used. And then a lot of my work, um, as was mentioned, I think a lot about architecture and the design of spaces and what kind of experience that allows for. And a specific area of architecture that's thinking about this ex exactly is psychogeography of in psychogeographic geography. You're, um, it's a scientific practice on the ways that design of a space um, allow you to feel. And so curved walls, you know, make you feel more relaxed or, you know, these different structures, the way that things are structured, they can create a different experience. So bringing all of that research into this space as well, because what I was intending to create was this environment in the web. And so then also going into producing the sound um, through a variety of different sound machines that I have, like a modular synthesizer or a beat machine. And then designing the space. So it's going to be, it, it, it's a space that exists in the web. You can actually go to it right now. It's metamorphosis. FM. 
and designing this whole space in a 3D rendering tool and then you know, putting it into the web. So it's a web VR environment with spatialized sound. And the spatialized sound is great because now you can exist within this space. You don't have to click anything. All you're doing is you're moving to and from the sources of sound. And these sources of sound are the spheres, the different colored spheres. So you see immediately the red sphere, then the orange sphere, then the green sphere. And all these different spheres have hyper-localized -local, um, sounds embedded within the sphere. So as you get closer to it, you hear the sound more loudly. And then as you move away, you hear it less, but then you begin to hear the next sound. So this passage, it feels like a fluid passage of, of sound and as you're moving through. And then again, with like the circular design, thinking a lot about psychogeography, how to create a space that feels calming and not um, imbuing of stress. So the design of the space of using a lot of curves and circles. And a lot of my work, I mean, one of my favorite tools to use is my modular synthesizer. Um, because for me, it just creates this entirely new experience of engaging with sound um, beyond like a, a software, but more of how can, um, how can I use a machine that has a, a variety of different ways to manipulate what's the outcome and it's tangible as a modular synthesizer is. Another really interesting, interesting thing about the modular synthesizers is that for one, you, you buy an empty rack and then you fill it up with components as you understand better what kind of sound you want to produce. And these components, the specific component pieces are called Euro racks. And so for me, I naturally built a system where I would create sounds that are more um, are more similar to sounds you would hear as Afro beats. They're, they're African drum pattern music, they're polyrhythmic, which is inherent in African drum pattern music. So to create sounds that are coming out um, that are that have origins much tied closer to um, African cultures, but using a tool that calls itself a Euro rack, um, for me is such an interesting space to explore, uh, you know, how I'm using these tools that are designed um, in a Eurocentric canon, but creating something that's completely outside of that. So that relationship between the two is what also draws me to this tool. And another thing that I had been exploring with this tool was um, you know, how dances go viral. And it's really interesting to watch how people move to dances, the, the way their body moves and how they perform in relation to the sound that they're hearing and um, how there seems to be this sort of unified experience of when you hear a certain sound, you don't have to see another person that's doing that kind of dance, you'll kind of naturally do a similar dance is what I've observed. And so I really wanted to hone in on that and create a database that captured how people are dancing um, in these like very intricate ways, but it's all very syn synonymous with the ways that other people in other parts of the world are dancing when they hear that music. And what is the relationship? What is the distinct relationship between certain sounds and the way that people are moving? So right now I'm doing a residency with New York Live Arts, which is this performance space in New York City. And I'm their first creative technologist. Usually it's a space where dancers have residencies and performers have residencies. So for me, I'm thinking a lot about how technology engages with dance and how we can use technology to observe dance. And so in this next slide, I'm gonna show a prototype that I've developed where I'm dancing in front of this camera um, and I'm using a machine learning algorithm that's able to identify where each part of my body is. Um, and so that's all you see is just the, the, the limbs of my body but then I'm also pairing it with sound that I was listening to while dancing that um, in that video. And, and I personally observed how the lower the sound would get, the lower my body naturally moved and the higher the sound, the higher my body naturally moved. So now it's a matter of building out more factors to test to understand how people are, you know, using sound to influence their bodily movements. <laughs> So it can keep going on. Um, and I'm gonna breeze through this part of research and pedagogy and then get to Afrodictopia and how it all funneled in. But a lot of my work engages with research, um, studying pedagogy in general as someone that loves the classroom and education and also indigenism and trees. Um, and you'll see how all of those ties together. But a lot of my work, it's, it's anti-siloed of I'm thinking of a lot of different spaces at one time and other people that I have found to do this way before me, but I didn't even know of as I was engaging in this kind of work included Stuart Brandt, who developed the whole earth catalog, which Steve Jobs has claimed to be Google, basically the origins of Google before Google was even thought of and existed decades before. So Stuart Brand being someone that's very critical of, you know, early age Silicon Valley and how 
we, uh, we now have tools that allow us to explore a lot of different parts of information and just information theory in general. The whole earth catalog was this synthesis of a variety of different information in one space. Uh, and what, you know, having, you know, sources like that did. Victor Papanek, um, someone who's very prolific in thinking critically about design and the ways that we're engaging with design. And um, who also is a, a, a champion of understanding that everything is connected, that there is no, you know, difference of understanding within the different parts of the world that we really need to understand all of these different parts of worlds. A lot of my research also engages with um, one book that I studied over the summer that, I, you know, has been paradigm shifting in so many ways was African Fractals by Ron Eglash, who um, went to the continent and cited a variety of different communities that exist within the continent and their approaches to math and how these math um, approaches were so much ahead of even European communities and these you know, people from Europe would come to Africa and think that things are in array, disarray and unorganized, but really it was an entire mathematical system that they were engaging with that was, you know, beyond an understanding of the visitors that they had. And it only, fractal maths only existed on the continent of Africa and uh, some parts of Asia, like India. Um, and then as a res uh, I got a fellowship at IBEAM, which is another art and technology space where I was thinking, using that time to think even more critically about information theory and pedagogy and design. So bringing in all these areas that I had researched, like um, you know, pedagogy of the oppressed and African fractals, and also the indigenism and trees and socialism to create a space. I was really interested in creating a space that would allow for people to move and thinking, you know, as I have here, the internet as an experience and not as a sort of purely utilitarian tool of, we kind of engage with the internet where we go from our search bar to a specific website and then that's it, that's the passage. And there's not really this experience of as we move through the internet, you know, what are we, you know, experiencing and moving through and also um, spontaneous discovery. The internet knows us so well at this point. It knows all of our behavioral data, it knows who we are, it knows the things that we're thinking. So there's not really much room for spontaneous discovery. So thinking of that, thinking of a vision for new worlds and digital architecture and psychogeography and bringing in all this research that I had done in this time. Um, and also this quote really ties into this work well of the only humane and effective way to break the negative grip of antique culture is with information. So how can I find ways to use a variety of different information to break up the status quo and social orientations that we naturally kind of gravitate towards just because people have told us that this is the space and to occupy and this is how we need to you know, present ourselves to break that up and allow us to you know, realize more agency and to learn more and you know, to use information in a paradigm shifting form. And so it was thinking about architecture and digital environments, but I don't, which I don't think really happens too much yet. Um, I think it's, we're really tapping into the potentials of the internet and we're not thinking about it so much as a spatial kind of possibility, but it's more of just like a hyperlink, you know, text-based space. But what if we thought about um, the internet as an architecture of a, like a physical, not tangible, but, you know, formed a 3D formed architecture. And so that was my prototype of creating these 3D spaces where I'm bringing in, you know, object oriented architecture and using those as different portals. Whereas you go closer to that, you know, space or you enter this portal, you're then merging, moving yourself into a space that's thinking very specifically about areas that would probably be very siloed traditionally, but they, there's a, a, a emergence of them in this new environment. So if you were entering this portal, you would, it would lead you into an environment on Dadaism and environmentalism, or in another portal, it would lead you into an environment merging quantum mechanics with sound design. So allowing for people to understand the relationships between vastly, seemingly different things, but really there's, there's a strong tie between them. And then it was a, a sharing of a lot of research and omni-specialized design in general. Um, and in sharing a lot of this research, a lot of this is also tying into Africtopia. Um, but before I get there, in sharing um, design on omni-specialized design, I usually start with this quote by Benjamin Bratton of the job of design in the 21st century is to undo much of the design of the 20th century. So oftentimes we think that um, you know, design is perfect the way it is. And we're kind of, we just need to learn how to do design and then, you know, we'll be set. But it really, we need to think very critically 
about the ways that we've been taught design and um, if that's really you know healthy for our world and if it's really sustainable, if it's really designed for us. And I think that's been something that's been so excellent about what's been happening in the States, particularly with the Black Lives Matter second uprising of it, is that we're, we're definitely challenging status quo a lot more and realizing that if it doesn't serve us, we have all the agency to change it and make it something that does serve us. So it's thinking, rethinking what design is, what the role of a designer is, what the principles we're building off of and ways to design. Um, so specifically about the role of a designer, understanding that design has to be done by a team. This team must not consist of only somebody who is a designer. It must consist of people from other disciplines. So understanding that design is not, you know, you just grab a bunch of people that think like you and you make something. It's really, you have to grab a bunch of people that know different facets of the things that you're interested in. And that's where you really develop comprehensive design. And Victor also says the most important team member besides the designer is a member of the user group. I scratch out user group because it's not a word that I usually like to use. It's very traditional of technology kind of orientations of, you know, it, it's the person that's on the receiving end of a product. But I think user, that word can often flatten the dimensionality of the person that's on the receiving end and kind of makes them just as a single purpose and doesn't recognize their humanity or other qualities. So often I try to replace it with intended beneficiary, but still agreeing with what Victor has said of the most important team member is a person that is on the receiving end of this potential product. And oftentimes design engages in a way where it's a savior sort of complex of it's a group of people entering a new community. They think they have all the answers and they have all this expertise and they Im impose all of their culture and ideas onto a different community and you know expect the com community to comply with it, but it's not that and it can never be that. And that's where disaster um, inevitably falls. So it's really about respecting the communities that you were entering in, understanding that they are an expert and their lived experience and their community and their culture and all of their practices. And so it's really about you taking a backseat and learning from them and then thinking of how can we work together to design. And so as Victor Popinick said, it's a group of people of a variety of different disciplines and this, this being an example of that. And the designer is merely a bridge between people of different experience, different um, you know, knowledges and practices. And you, you're creating the shared language between all of these different people. And again, design with and not for. So it's not about you know, entering these spaces, but it's about entering and understanding that you have to learn before you do anything. So principles we're building design off of since European enlightenment, often it's been industrialization and, and capitalism. These are the main pillars of design and these are what's propelling design forward. And in Julia Watson's book that I've shown a few times on radical indigenism, she very excellently expands on this idea of how there's a mythology of technology that's at the core of humanism, colonialism, and racism, which inherently produces capitalism, and how it's often severed from its understandings of indigenous innovation, ancestral intelligence, and local wisdom. So we think that we understand what technology is, is the sort of hyper-productive, hyper-capital, um, producing entity, but really it's what's been existing in our, our world for centuries and ages. And it's something that is so rooted in the practices of indigenous people, of ancestral practices, and how um, we really should be closer to what they've been doing as they know technology more than we'll ever understand it. And Dory Turnstall gives a really great quote on why are we creating these boundaries between human and the non-human, the flora and the fauna and the supernatural? Are there other values or principles that we can take into account that will bring us closer as opposed to creating divisions? Because for a really, really long time, we've been designing with the exclusion of all other forms. So also as we design, we're thinking only specifically about people and you know, human centric design and how does, you know, how to make our lives, our personal lives as a single species and a, and a planet filled with so many other species, how to make it only efficient for us. And I think Dory Turnstall does a great job expanding on this idea of, you know, questioning why are we doing that? And so something that I've been challenging a lot is this idea of human centric design. I feel like there's a place for it, there always will be, but I think we've kind of used it and gone too far with this idea of human centered design um, and we're not thinking about ecologically centered design. How can we make sure that the entire, all sentient beings are being considered with our design? Um, and so research and pedagogy, when you're doing it in interdisciplinary ways, you get a fuller picture. Sciences, we often think are apolitical and objective and there never are. Nothing is apolitical, nothing is 
objective. There's always, and, and objectivity is something that's questioned a lot with this idea of cybernetics, which I have on the humanity side of, we often think that um, often it's, you know, white anthropologists entering these foreign areas and they give their interpretation of what this culture is doing. And it's understanding that that's their interpretation of this culture. And when you step, take a step back and you understand second wave cybernetics, which is placing the, the person that's observing or the entity that is observing this feedback loop as also a contribution to this loop, you understand that you can never um, rely off of a certain perspective. You always need to have multiple perspectives to have a fuller picture. And so this interdisciplinary pedagogical design feeds into the courses that I teach at NYU and have designed and teach at NYU, like the revolution we digitize, which is thinking about surveillance and politics and sociology and ecology, as well as designing club culture, which is thinking about electromedia in addition to race and counterculture and audiovisuality and sound. So the relationships of all of these different kind of facets of life and how they all come together to serve a unified purpose. So finally to Afrodictopia of how all of this builds into um, the structure and creating this. Um, and so I'll, I'll breeze through this. So we have 15 minutes of Q and A, um, breeze through this in six minutes. Um, Don't feel but... pressured. We can bleed over a little bit if you want to. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so with Afrotectopia, it was an institution that I built while a graduate student at NYU. I was in my second year. I loved being in the program. I loved learning of all these different cool ways to use technology and art in tandem and engineering and design. I saw so many possibilities, but I was also constantly frustrated by the program of the lack of racial diversity, both within the students and no full-time black faculty. So having to deal with that, not really having a community of people at all that I could look to that were black and, and looking at technology in a critical or creative way. Um, you know, just a, a lack of community really and a lack of guidance and mentorship. So set out to create this festival um, that would that would happen while still being a student. So designed it and everything while a student and it sold out quickly of it, which affirmed how a lot of other people were feeling this loss and void of not having a space to be black, be happy and you know, full of their own humanity in a space that's also very technical and artistic. So um, it sold out, people came, hundreds of people came. We had amazing conversations and the, the, the project continued from there, but it always really continues off the momentum of people. And so we had our festival, first festival in 2018. We had a summer camp in 2019 for, it was free for seventh through 12th graders. We had our uh, second festival at Google, New York City in 2019, last summer. And then we more recently at the beginning of this year, we had a school of Afrotectopia. So this was sort of like an adult, adult version of the summer camp of um, the work that's coming out of Afrotopia, we're thinking critically about art, the emergence of art, design, technology, Black culture, and activism. And so those are the, the five main pillars that and continue within all the work of Afrotopia. So in the School of Afrotopia, we had different professionals that have done a variety of work in different areas. We had Nabil Hussain, who is a PhD student at NYU, teaching a class, taught a class at the School of Afrotopia on computing, climate change, and Black futurity. We had Ladan Said, who is an artist and technologist and researcher who was teaching about poetics of abstraction. So using, um, using I forgot what software to allow people to turn data into um, you know, some sort of interactive element. We had Mutale Nkande, who is CEO of AI for the People, who does a lot of work on you know, AI, technology, and society, teaching about how to, how to get into public tech. So, you know, a bunch of facets on how to engage with art, design, technology, Black culture, and activism through their own lenses. And then we also recently produced the Imagineer Fellowship. So this wrapped up this summer. It happened, it wrapped up this summer um, where it was about bringing in a few different fellows um, and allowing them to come together and imagine. And I'll go into the structure of it a bit, but the main idea for the fellowship was about individualism versus community. And um, as a professional, you know, in the professional space doing creative technology, I'm often doing a lot of different residencies because it's a great space to be able to just fund your, your work and continue to explore. But the way that it's designed is often you as an artist gets a lump sum of money from some institution and then you go off and build and then you come back and present and then that's it. But I wanted to create a space that was specifically about a communal practice, about community over individualism, so that all the fellows are working together on different projects as opposed to um, as opposed to them working independently on their own. And with the fellows and curating all of them and having interviews with each person, 
it was about really bringing in an omni specialization as far as their practice of black futures. So we had people that were coming in that were game designers or um, digital humanities, engaging in digital humanities or machine learning or community organizing. We also understood, I mean, something that's important to me is recognizing that blackness is not a monolith and that people are entering with a lot of different understandings of their own blackness and what being black means. And a lot of that also comes from your ethnicity and cultural background. So beyond black as a culture, there's subcultures within it. And so we had people that were from a variety of different subcultures of blackness, like a black British, West African, you know, Mexican American, French, Beninese, Haitian, et cetera. And then their perspectives were also ranging. So it wasn't, you know, understanding that just because you're black, um, that you have a similar perspective based on, you know, your sexuality or your socioeconomic standing, those are also contributing factors into the way that you operate. So again, people of varying socioeconomic status from working class to upper class, people of all over the um, world, people of different sexuality, fluid, trans, you know, um, non-binary, cisgender, et cetera. And rooting the practice in what I've alluded to before of technology is merely an extension of human capability. It's not, I don't see technology personally as a synonym for digitality. It's not, you know, technology is not a computer. It's not merely what it is. Technology is only about extending the, the possibility of whatever being is using it. And also to get away from this human-centered philosophy, technology is merely an extension of sentient capability. So it's understanding that it's not just humans that have developed technology all this time, it's any sentient being, they've been trying to figure out how to make their lives a little bit easier. And so they develop their own forms of technology. And so with the fellows, they were from all over the world, all over the country, from every part of the States, from you know the West to the East, to the South, to the North, to the Midwest, and from Accra, Ghana, to the UK, to France, who then moved to the Netherlands. And the objectives being to build a micro community, collaboratively design healthy black futures and share all research. And so they, um, we also had imaginariums where they would, this was a space where people that weren't selected to be the fellows and they were um, the general back public who were also interested in engaging in these conversations, they had a space to go to, to engage in this research in tandem with the fellows. And so these were public conversations open to the black public, anyone could come, it was free. We would have a guest speaker that would share their work. And then we would, um, so we had Olivia Michaela Moss for Inventing Black Radical Futures or Isle Damalon Consende for Black um, Future Cities, et cetera. Um, and then we would break them up after the presenter spoke into small groups and they would work on a mirror board and ideate on, you know, for this one, designing future cities, what does that mean? And then we would come together for a collective conversation where everyone would talk about the things that happened in their circles. So they were building community in smaller circles, but then we come back together and build more community all together. And it's just like a really cathartic and reflective conversation on what's the future and how are we gonna get closer to that? And so it was about building a micro community. It was about creating healthy black futures. It was about open source, developing open source pedagogy. And um, we did that through a variety of different fellowships. We built a syllabus, which you actually, you can find online. It's open, it's always been open and free for anyone to access. We reflected on readings every week. There were a variety of different readings. We had guest speakers come in. Like here we had Raphael Smith, who was the design director at IDEO, telling us about his idea of solar powered reparations. And we would vision map and we would prototype and then create these micro prototypes of a possible solution for the, the prompt that we were solving for that week. And then the fellows actually all released their own essays of a reflection on the fellowship, what they engaged in, what they learned, and how they imagine you know, going forward and, and building in the future. And essentially all the work that's coming out of Africatopia is about planting seeds for radical black imagination. And so it's hard to always see the fruits of, the, the fruits of our labor um, and bear them personally, but it's about creating space for imagination and understanding that's really important to just imagine and dream and ideate. And so I wanna leave you all with a few things that are guiding lights for me of understanding that it's always about creating space for imagination as its manifestation. So the more you speculate and imagine and dream and build, the more likely it's about, it's, it's gonna earth, unearth itself and become true. And that everything is fluid, there are no silos. So it's not about, you know, a college campus, we typically have a chemistry building on this side of the campus and the public um, policy, you know, building on this side of campus. But it's, it's really, you know, destroying that sort of dichotomy. There is a fluid relationship between all of these things and we combine, we can combine a bunch of different disciplines if we choose to. So thank you for having me and you can keep up with any of the work um, through these handles. 
Hey, can everyone come off mute and just give a round of applause of sound of appreciation? <laughs> um, wow, Ari, that was, in, you do a lot. I, you definitely deserve that, got that sip of water that was necessary. Um, oh, so many. Um, so there's so much to kind of still dig into in terms of everything that you flagged. It's, you, you've incredibly covered so many different facets from the manifestation through technology and theory to um, social empowerment and giving people space in order to visualize beyond their initial circumstances. Um, I really wish that I, I guess there could have been a conversation between you um uh robin walker and Muqtada yusuf who we had previously that were discussing um examples of uh, uh success and signs of brilliance in different civilizations as well as what it was like to live in those environments and living in a, in a state that was beyond survival um, and what does that look like what how do people operate because sometimes the context for culture is always always about um survival and preservation rather than extension and looking forward um for a lot of cultures um we have quite a few questions um that i think i'm going to start from the top and just kind of like flag through um and then I'll, i'm going to ask people to come off mute and just vocalize for yourself um chloe i know you got a couple so get ready um <laughs> Um, if we go to start from the top there, what well, you, you said something about sound and the effect on the body, Chloe, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, thanks. This, everything was really interesting, uh, which is why I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> I, uh, what, when you're talking about sound and the effect on the body and the effect it has on trauma, it made me think of sound baths. I don't know. I'm sure you must know about it. And um, I thought the big thing with the sound bath um, is like the vibration that it creates and like that is supposed to like heal your body. So I'm kind of curious if um, you've seen any research about like um, sound coming from speakers because I imagine like sound coming from your personal laptop probably doesn't have that same, um, you know, effect on the body and the trauma. So does it have the same effect or... Yeah, it's such a great question. It's a really cool place to explore. I would love to dive deep in, deeper specifically into that research. From my research and understanding of sound, though, it's vibration creates different sounds. So it's it's as long as that sound is able to get to that frequency, that's the frequency that signs the different chakra. So if the vibration still exists. It still happens regardless of what instrumentation it's doing because it's getting to that frequency, as far as I know. But now it's time to revisit that section. Um, there's also, I can make a reference of a publication that discusses the, the shift from um, organic instruments to digital instruments and how it has an impact on brain waves. And um, what that also does in terms of how, how we as physically reset. So the same way that your, um, your organs at some point shut off at different times in the day in order to go into a place of recovery, for example, your stomach um, ending at 10 p.m. in order to give it a bit of a rest if you're eating all day to kind of rebuild. Um, there's that kind of element for um, neutralizing the frequencies that are in your body because everything that's alive has a different level or mode of activity. And there's that thing of creating synergy. Um, I'll find the resources and I'll, and I'll post them to you later. Um, is, I can also pass them over to you, Ari, if you're interested. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Um, there was a, a statement from Wendy um, who expressed that, um, that, I guess at that point, in discussing how interesting it was that you're discussing about the, the making music process and obvious that make you think about um, teenage engineering, except it does it include social or political topics. Um, there and then Chloe followed up with that was asking for recommendations on um, discovery of psychogeography, if you had any. Yeah, I can put places of the heart, which is the main. You can also just email them to me later, but you can just vocalize a couple now if you've got any um, off the top of your head. Okay, I'm also gonna put in. I I get asked about the books a lot. I have a, a online book list that I can share too. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. Um, just send that over and then we can dive into that. Um, uh, then following on um, is 
how much of an um, of architecture can these spaces be if they're if they're felt or experienced through the two D portal of um, the digital screen? So I guess it's talking about the physical impact of these acoustic experiences or um, or just purely visual experiences. How how does that relate to actually being there versus digital manifestations? Um, how much of the architecture can these spaces be? Uh, I think architecture, how much of an architecture can these spaces be if they're experienced? Um, architecture, I think there's so much room to explore with architecture. I think we, architecture, the practice is so confined to these specific ways of thinking, but I think it absolutely can exist in spaces if it's just 2D and on a screen, it's still existing as a form in a, you know, a design of a space that you can enter into, especially when it's a 3D rendered environment through a screen. It obviously has a much different effect than if you were able to walk into the space um, personally in the, in the real world. But I, I absolutely still believe that architecture can still um, be something that's implemented in, in 2D spaces that are 3D rendered. Um, there's also development and technologies in terms of just using the um, sound only to create, um, for example, singular beams of sound. There's technology out there that I've used that is not necessarily human friendly, but um, there are ways in which you can isolate audio and how that can impact um, people's experiences. Um, uh, we can. Uh, there's some other stuff I can bring in for that as well. Um, Iris, still, do you want to expand on your point? I think you already touched more or less on that. I was also wondering about this translation of this healing experience with sound from the digital uh, platform, like very much in a screen time, especially now with lockdown and all of these situations into this like real body, I guess. I'm sorry about the mask, but this is how I have to <laughs> be from first, now on. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yes, yeah, so I think you kind of already touched about this, this topic, but thank you so much for for your intervention too. Cool. cool. Um, Chloe, you own this. Do you want to go about, about the digital realm? Go for it. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, about how, because you talked about um, going more towards ecologically centered design, but um, the digital field is quite um, consuming in energy and also has its own forms of like programmed obsolescence, obsolescence and things like that. So are there ways that that, you know, that kind of field is becoming more ecologically centered? The way that the digital field is becoming more ecologically centered? Um, I think there are a lot of people questioning it. I don't think it's something that's being enacted in right now. Um, I was part of like a, a, a residency that was thinking specifically about um, distributed networks of care by Taeyun Choi. Um, and that was a space where we were all thinking about how can we get away from these hyper-centralized uh, forms of network design where you know everyone's coming to the same place and that's kind of a distributing everyone else to these other spaces there's a, a lot of control in that way and how can we instead create these peer-to-peer -peer networks that are more like you know trees like it's so fascinating to study trees and then also be a technologist and understand how trees they all communicate with one another they have their own mycelium in their roots mycelium in the roots that are their own sort of internet infrastructure where they're sharing a bunch of information to each other um and it's all, it's, there's no central tree that's like sending it all out to each other.